By the way, Bob, I've decided your name is the man behind the monsters. Fair enough. Howdy. Panel, do you need a character that's not uh, below ground? Give me just one second. Yeah, that wouldn't make any sense. So one challenge with that, Pino, if anyone PMs you questions, you're going to have to send them to me here. Oh, so Yeah, because you're in my Doc Hoffman account. That's fine. I just, um, I'm going to tell everybody to put them in here. So, Bob, just a little tip. Don't read the text that come through on the chat screen as this is going along, so probably uh, send you off track. I'll send you all the questions. It just keep your, it'll help a little bit. Okie doke. That and the group tends to have um, side conversations, let's put it that way. Fair enough. So, Bob, by the way, the current record is held by uh, Lee at 48 people in this room. That I can believe. You put the word lead in front of your title and it tends to attract more people. Actually, he beat Lisa by just a couple. Okay, that is a little surprising. I'd forgotten that Lisa did this first. And he beat Ryan, too. No, you might be hitting the mumble limit, so uh, you'll never get past 48 because uh, apparently it'll disconnect you at around 49. It goes to 50. We've had it there. Hoffman, I want to say thanks again. These chats are awesome. Keep them coming. Thanks, and uh, well, the only way I can do that is because people volunteer. You can catch Spitfire tomorrow, so. The other thing, Bob, just so you know, it'll tend to grow over the time. You know, so it starts with eh, 20, 30 people, and then the room fills. It's kind of interesting. Makes sense. The other thing to keep in mind, Bob, is when, now that you have Mumble set up, most of the groups have Mumble or something. And if you ever wanted a group to go out and work with you on escalations or help, good chance to just pop in a channel and find them. Yeah, of course, right now I got this set up on the, uh, the conference room, so it's not actually my computer. We're, we're all set up in a big room, so it's kind of weird trying to do stuff at our own desks and that kind of thing. They can't get your own cubicle? No, we all have, we, we're in uh, more like the, the strike team kind of arrangement. It's good for communication. But not so good when you're on the phone or doing a loud, you know, online conversation. So you guys are in like a horseshoe developer setup? It's basically just, you know, we, we there's like four desks together in each individual area. Um, and that way we can all see each other and talk within the group that's doing something related. Like our, our group, the group I'm in right now is focused mostly on the settlement stuff. So who's in that group with you? Torque, uh, Dave, one of the artists, and Paul, one of the programmers. By the way, I didn't know I didn't know you were working on settlement stuff, so I'm going to add some questions there. Torque knows all the answers to that, though, so um, I, I'm more the backup to help out. I get you, and Torque's in Europe for a couple weeks. Exactly. So guess what? You get to be Torque. I can't live up to that, unfortunately. I'm joking with you. So, quick side question. Um, do you guys ever in plan on increasing like the application server size? Because I know there's a little bit of latency and uh, a lot of requirements for uh, system resources. Yeah, I haven't heard anything about that kind of stuff, but I, that's not necessarily a conversation I would be involved in. Steven's the one for those, right? Um, server stuff is mostly kind of a mark area for that, that kind of stuff. All right, I'm just collecting names of who should be in my next chats.
Yeah, Mark's probably a tough get, but he, he's definitely our most knowledgeable server guy. He's a tough get, man. I'll just call Lisa and Ryan and have one of them help me. Yeah. There you go. You mean like an overall level of your character? Yeah, You're very broken. It, it's a pretty tough thing for us to to break it all into one number that really gets everything across. But but we do know that we need to get a lot more information out there in front of people and to try to summarize it a little better. But I don't know what kind of schedule we've got. For He's talking about literally the power bar number. Oh, you mean, um, yeah, I, I don't know when we might add that kind of information, um, but um, yeah, I haven't seen the exact plan for that. I know that a lot of the UI that you're seeing right now is kind of, uh, it, it's not the long-term plan for a lot of that stuff, so it's, it's missing prototype. a lot of information. All right, if everybody can uh, mute their mics, that'd be great. If you have questions, you can PM them to me um, in Mumble, preferably, You could, or you can send them in channel. So with that, we'll start our, uh, this is our Fourth, Keepside Chat with the Pathfinder University. Uh, today we have Gobbleworks Bob, the man behind the monsters. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Pathfinder University is a company for new players that holds daily classes. You can check us out at pathfinderuniversity.com and our class list at classes.pathfinderuniversity.com. So, Bob, can you just introduce yourself to the group? What you do, who you are, and things like that. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Bob Settles. I, my title here is the PVE designer. So I focus on all of the encounters that you run into, the escalations, um, to, that covers everything from the random encounters to, to the events, um, involves working in Unity to set up the, uh, you know, how the encounter area is set up. So putting down all the tents, putting the monsters in there, deciding which kinds of monsters come in all of that kind of stuff. Um, and on top of that, I do little, you know, odd jobs here and there. So like I, I took on a lot of the, uh, the common saying stuff. So, so you can say hail Asmodeus and th things like that in there. And um, generally speaking, I try to help out in whatever's involved in the PVE stuff. But obviously, that's also spread out with, you know, a lot of the gathering stuff is handled by Lee, a lot of the combat stuff is handled by Steven. So there's a pretty good spread of everybody working on stuff. And kind of what's your background, Bob? How'd you get here? So I've been working in games for roughly 20 years. Um, wanted to do it ever since I was about 14 and you know, got my own computer at home. Um, since then, I, I, you know, I, I actually wasn't quite sure how to get into the industry. I wound up instead pursuing some philosophy degrees and stuff like that, but decided that that wasn't for me and um, got a job at Quicksilver Software in California, worked with them on uh, some Castles RTS style games. From there, I went to FASA Interactive briefly. Um, that led to being at Bungie, uh, where I worked on Myth 2 Soul Blighter and a um, lot of other stuff. Um, spent most of the last 10 years at Microsoft in their publishing department and then decided that I really wanted to get back into development, saw the uh, position open here, and it sounded a lot like the stuff I'd done on, on uh, Myth 2, so I applied and thankfully got the job and been here for the last year or so. That's great. Hey, um, so what's your vision for PVE overall? I mean, because you're actually the man behind this. So a lot of this was actually already in place when I got here, um, working with Rich Baker before um, before I got the job, and so some of, so a lot of what's going on is based on on a pretty long term plan that's been around for a couple of years, but the basic overall idea is for the escalations to keep the world feeling dynamic, for there always to be interesting things landing near everybody, but at the same time it's not a 
you know, um, a crafted experience relative to each player. It's the world changing around you and you having to deal with whatever comes your way. But that said, what we really hope to add, the side, the side of all this that's not in right now, is to get things to the point where instead of just randomly landing, the escalations are actually somewhat triggered by other settlements that are fighting against you. So, you know, players from one settlement could go and battle, say, the Bone Dancers and get something out of that they can use to plant the Bone Dancers near their enemies um, right before they're about to do a major attack or something like that. And likewise, we want to add some stuff in so that currently everything you can do with an escalation is basically fighting. We don't have any faction stuff. We don't have any of those kinds of things. So there's there isn't such a thing as, oh, well, that's an evil escalation. And so good people are fighting that and, and or that one is associated somewhat with this deity. So people who are somewhat tangentially associated with that deity shouldn't bother to fight it. But likewise, we don't have anything in there where. Um, let's say that there's a big escalation running near Golgotha and they're fighting to get rid of it. We want to add events later that Brighthaven could participate in to actually make the escalation strengthen so that it, it gets harder for Golgotha to fight it. We want to bring in a lot of those, the politics of the PvP side and make those interact with the PvE side. That's the, the biggest part of the vision that's not yet been realized. Wow, so you're telling me we can move escalations, drop them on our favorite friends, and then make them worse? Eventually. Eventually being you know, six months, a year, or being like forever away from now? I'm not sure how far out that's going to be. Um, we've got a lot of other things we've got to focus on right now. Um, I would hope that at least some portions of it would be in within a year or so. That's way cool. And, and I think I remember seeing something in there that, you know, some of the drops are going to get better for kind of getting the boss and things that might help the settlement grow and the POI. Is that the case? Yeah, that's one of the sort of base levels of the long-term plan is that um, killing off the escalation is supposed to result in some rewards that, a, that are settlement level rewards. They're rewards that aren't really about the individual players who did it. They're about the settlement that participated in getting rid of that escalation. And they can bring like home a trophy or something like that. And that might increase their amount of influence um, or help them in other ways. So that's, and that's one of the biggest things that's missing right now from the whole equation of, you know, you can get rid of an escalation that's near you, but all that really does is give you a 12 to 36 hour window where there's no escalation in that hack or in that monster hex. And, um, Hopefully, if you know if it was a tough escalation, it gets rid of them so that you have some easier monsters, just so your gatherers aren't getting killed off constantly. But without those big rewards for it, you don't have quite the incentive that we want you to have to deal with the escalations as quickly as you can. So, with that in mind, I mean, you've got a whole bunch of things moving around in these settlements, and not all the settlements are there and population. And I know you and I have emailed before, but. You know, I mean, is the numbers for the settlements matter for the escalation? So, like, if we have, like, X amount of players, you're going to have to see more monsters, or is that not going to change? Right now, there's nothing in there that does that takes into account anything around the territory. We, we do hope to eventually have something where, like I said, we, we want to have it so that the, the players themselves are the ones who are kind of helping to decide where the escalations wind up because they're kind of trying to inflict them on their enemies. And what that will probably mean is that the bigger settlements are inflicting the worse escalations on the other big settlements. But on top of that, there will probably always be occasions where, you know, nobody happens to have triggered an escalation there for a while. And so it's time for us to just pick one randomly. And we would like to have something that takes into account, you know, something about the settlement to decide. Like maybe the, the example I keep giving is as a very simplistic Tolkien-esque one would be that if a settlement has a lot of gold, that might attract a dragon or something like that, which I should say is in no way promising a dragon, but um, that's something that, that would make sense, that there are certain monsters that are attracted to certain kinds of resources, and they might be attracted to, to a settlement that's rich in those. Um, but a lot of that stuff is, is definitely much further off. Yeah, and you just opened the door to one of the questions we had, which was, what about dragons or big monsters or un unleash the Trask or something? 
Yeah, that kind of stuff is we have to figure out a lot of the things that go into um, much larger scale warfare, which gets you back into the whole formation based combat. Um, and even on that topic, eventually we do hope that the bosses are more formation level combat kind of thing. So that, because right now they're just, you know, tougher monsters. We hope that the that the when you when the boss shows up, it's more like the boss and a formation running. But once we get to that kind of level of, of combat, we can start talking about, well, what would it mean to fight a large monster that's that's sitting there? We we currently don't have any of that kind of capability. And and a lot of that stuff kind of fits very much in with the theme park MMO stuff. And given the way that we're trying to, you know, get the most bang for our buck, we get a lot more out of out of smaller monsters and then doing the formations. But as we start to have a lot more of that tech, then we can start thinking about what we might do in terms of an occasional large monster. So what do you mean about uh, formation? Talk about that. So one of the ways to make combat work more smoothly for us when we've got, you know, hundreds of, of combatants on each side is for us to get people to group up into formations because then we can treat everybody as sort of more a part of this larger whole. Um, we haven't actually worked out all the details, but once once you were in that, you would have something, some, some way that you can contribute to the formation as it's battling. As, as you know, one formation could actually battle potentially against smaller enemies that are fighting it, but most likely it would be one formation up against another formation. Um, but we're pretty far off from actually having something we can show on that. We mostly just want to say that there's supposed to be some way that you as a company or as a settlement can all group together and say, yeah, we're all attacking this, this other settlement as one large combat organization so that you can be more effective than, you know, 50 people running randomly around not knowing who to attack and that kind of thing. That's fair. So, I mean, what, uh, you, what's your kind of crystal ball? We're going to see kind of the big monsters first or, you know, everybody keeps asking about dungeons. That's a good question. Um, I would, I would certainly say that we'll see formations before we see either of those. Um, yeah, I, I think probably <laughs> this is probably one of those ones that I would guess will come down to some crowd forging. It that as we get closer, we'll be, we'll be starting to gauge what people are looking for, where where their interest lies on that kind of stuff. I don't think we've actually got a specific plan for, for what the order of those things is. Yeah, we've had a lot of questions about uh, dungeons. It's come up in every course and every every uh, class, and everybody's had kind of a different answer from God works went along, but the answer we've gotten so far is, you know, we're talking about six to 12 months. Is that fair? I, I hate making promises or even guesses, but um, it's I do know that it's something that we've we've been talking about and planning and, and thinking about, but as far as the ordering of it, um, I mean, it's definitely at least say nine months off just simply because we couldn't really do the work for it in less than that. Um, but I don't think we'll probably even be sitting down and saying, you know, here's where it fits on the roadmap for at least another couple of months while we finish off a lot of the stuff that's being worked on right now. And that's fair. I'm not trying to drag you into exact dates or anything, promises like that. So you were talking a little about kind of how you guys work together, and you were talking a little about kind of your office setup. What's the, what's the dynamic like working at Gobmworks? It's pretty similar to a lot of the other small companies that I've worked at. Um, you know, everybody's talking about almost everything in the game. So, I mean, I say that my job is PVE designer. But I wind up talking about a lot of the PvP stuff, talking over a lot of the combat stuff, um, talking about UI stuff, and, and everybody else winds up, you know, giving me advice on what we should put into the PvE thing um, and how the escalation should work and all that kind of stuff. Everybody just kind of pitches in on whatever needs doing. Um, also, because we are so small, it also means that, you know, we, we have to all participate in doing um, a lot of the testing and a lot of the you know customer support so you'll see me in the help channel on a semi-regular basis uh, although sometimes i'm in the help channel as one of my actual regular characters because we also all try to run around and actually play the game as well so we get an experience of that 
Um, one of the biggest things that's a huge difference between working a, at a smaller company like ours and at some of the larger companies that I've, I've had experience with is just that everybody has to be able to switch to doing a lot of different things at a time. We don't have a lot of things where somebody just specializes in one really tight thing. Like when I was finishing up at Bungie, we were moving from where, where when I started, we were hiring people who, you know, our artists needed to be able to concept and model and texture and animate. And then when we finished up, we were starting to advertise for somebody who could just animate, animate quadrupeds. And then we would hire somebody else to animate bipeds. And we were hiring to hire people to really, really specialize on stuff. And we, we tried to have a little bit more of the jack of all trades mentality for people here. So who's animating and designing these big blue gelatin squares we're seeing lately? Yeah, that's our, our fun import process. Um, and I, I won't name names on that one, but um, one of the things that happens is is that as we import stuff, so some, some art gets corrected, and uh, as we import things, um, sometimes the collision boxes become visible. But because the import process isn't happening visually in front of anybody, nobody actually sees it. And then again, because we, you know, we haven't had time to implement a lot of the tools that would let us do our testing in a much more uh, coordinated and efficient manner, like just having some kind of system that shows us all the encounters one after another to look for visual glitches. We tend to, you know, find these things by running around. And since the catapults are only in a very small number of, of encounters, they only show up rarely and it's a totally random thing. So we can run around playing for like three or four hours and never spot it. And then the next day, you know, everywhere you go, there's a blue catapult. So it's just an unfortunate thing about our, our process. Um, but as we move along, we'll add more of those uh, more automated testing and stuff like that so that we can catch those things a little, easy, a little more quickly. Fortunately, that's also one of those things that's easy to fix. So uh, that should be fixed in the next build. So you talked about uh, playing the game. What's your character? So I've got three characters running around. Um, I admit that probably not surprisingly for a PvE designer, I tend to be a little bit more of a solo player and less of a you know, uh, run around fighting other players kind of, kind of person. So I tend to solo against, um, you know, escalations and stuff like that, which which means I'm fighting things that are way below the level of my character. But I've got um, one character who's basically specializing in um, bow and one-handed sword. And so that's my person who I go around just killing things to try to get recipes with. Then I've got another character who is essentially specializing in crafting and refining pretty much everything low level so that I can run around to auction houses, buying things on the cheap and crafting things, crafting whatever I can get the ingredients for. Um, and then I've got another character who just specializes in gathering so that I can get the ingredients for that person when I'm missing a couple of things. And also just so I can have more stuff to sell in the auction house. Well, if you need a company, you can always join the university. That's true. I think I'm already a member of the uh, our, our lovely Bloodstone group of, of uh, Paizo and Goblin Works employees. Oh, I didn't realize there was a company just for you guys. There, there's one so that we don't, um, you know, cause too much interference with other groups and that kind of thing. But the problem is you're not attached to a settlement, so you're not going to be able to train. I believe we're actually attached to Brighthaven at this point. Um, but, we, you know, we'll probably shuffle around and stuff like that, so... Hey, that's fine. So um, you said you're out soloing. Do you think people should be able to solo in this game? I mean, that's been a good debate. So my hope is that the game will be just, you know, will hit a sort of a balance where people are able to solo, um, but that people find that it's always better to match up with somebody. Um, and admittedly, right now, we use a pretty heavy hammer on that where, you know, after a certain point, you really can't proceed unless you go and join a settlement. Hopefully there will be settlements that just kind of take, you know, all comers and everybody can join. Um, but there's always going to be that situation where you log on and there just doesn't happen to be anything going on right near you that interests you. Um, and so you need to get from one place to another. So we always hope that there's at least something to do while you're soloing um, on, on your way to something. Um, but the idea is for that always to be something where you're you're kind of missing out. You're, you would have gotten more loot. You would have gotten better loot because you could tackle heavier monsters, that kind of thing. Um, 
but but yeah, I'm like I said, I'm I'm tend to be more of a solo player. I'll always be pushing that there's at least something there for solo players to do. But given the dynamics with the PvP and stuff, it's going to be very very dangerous. So you'll have to learn tricks to get away quickly and that kind of thing. And just so I know, I mean, are you are you in charge of the loot tables too? Is that part of your PvE role? The loot tables were actually set up by Steven. Um, right now, they're pretty much strictly attached to the monsters themselves. I did set up some loot tables for the boss monsters, which is the part where the party that kill, that actually strikes the killing blow, everybody will get an expendable of some kind that's related to that boss. Um, in, and in the longer run, we hope to have more loot tables for you know quests and stuff like that that are appropriate. But they'll always probably be kind of, um, they won't be all that generous. The main thing you're supposed to be getting stuff from is actually just killing monsters and, and gathering. And that's fair. And there's a question about how about getting spells from spells casters or things like that. Yeah, right now, I, last time I talked to Steven about that, he had just, you know, initially set things up so that pretty much everybody just drops all the expendables. There is... There is a certain amount of specialization where you'll notice that the wolves tend to drop pelts and stuff like that, and the goblins drop their, you know, sticky substances and stuff like that. Um, and eventually, I believe he hopes to go back and, and start spreading those, you know, cutting the expendables a little bit more. But to a certain degree, until we uh, seed the economy, we wanted to make sure that, the, that all that stuff was pretty widespread. But it seems like right now, you know, getting spells and some of the maneuvers is pretty hard. That is true. Um, and it's always a tough balance for us to strike between um, the sort of simulation-y side of things, making sure that, you know, the drops you get make sense and all that kind of thing, but also making it so that things aren't too farmable, where we find that players just, you know, all the wizards just do nothing but fight other wizards because they all want more spells and stuff like that. So we like to have a little bit of spread, but, but yeah, it is true that spells are pretty hard to come by. And given that we don't let you know kind of a way to sort of up your number of spells, it does, it does make it a little tricky. I think as things go along, if we start finding that, that people just aren't getting spells, um, and in particular, if we find that they're not showing up in the auction houses for people to buy, that, that we would look at, at the numbers and make the spells drop a little more often relative to recipes or something like that. So that's an interesting insight. So you use the auction houses to kind of see what's going on in the economy and kind of what people are getting? Yeah, we're still, again, low on some of the tools that let us quickly look and see exactly how much of each item is available out there. So we, we depend on postings on the forums and people in the chat saying, you know, hey, I've been playing for X number of hours and I still haven't seen a single spell or anything like that. Um, so, but, so we depend on those, but the auction houses give us a quick glimpse at what's being put up for sale. Um, I, I, I've actually been really happy this last week to see that people are using the auction house a lot more now that you can see only the active stuff. I see a lot more stuff in there. But I do note that there's not a ton of spells in, inside the auction houses. And, and that may be a sign that either people are hoarding them so that they can have to, so that their company is ready for new, new players and can, can outfit their spellcasters, um, or just a sign that we don't have enough of them in the game to, to make them available enough that people feel they have access they can drop off. Yeah, you probably don't want to look at my bank account at the hoard I'm trying to make there for the university. How, I mean, how, yeah, it, how, it does make things difficult. Yeah, I mean, how would you know? I mean, because I, mean, I know a lot of companies are doing exactly that. They're kind of keeping things for themselves, and then it gets hard for you to figure out what's going on. Yeah, I mean, theoretically, we have we have access to all that data, and we could tell how many of every item is available inside the game. But knowing that it's available, that people are, you know, that people have it, is not the same as it being active in the economy. Um, it's it's like you know. We also have to worry about inflation with coins and, and, you know, we'll eventually have to worry about coin sinks and stuff like that. But you don't really have inflation until people are rapidly spending money because uh, inflation is a combination of money supply and money, you know, and spending velocity. But the same thing is true with recipes. Are, are there enough recipes available? Well, in, not in, in the sense that there aren't any available in the auction house and so nobody looking for them can find them and buy them. There's not enough available. But we could find out that there's, you know, thousands of them floating around. It's just that nobody wants to part with them. So we have to find that balance where 
it, it's not so much about how many are out there in the world, but about people's perception of whether the number they have means they have excess that, and that they're better off getting gold than holding on to those spells. But right now we're out of discussion. I mean, most people don't trade in coin or really use coin for much of anything. I mean, I bought some stuff on the auction house, but it's been very rare. Yeah, eventually um, we'll start to have coin sinks for the settlements themselves, and that'll cause the settlements to need to raise money. Um, of course, they may just choose to do it by taxing their, their citizens, and, and then the citizens may choose to get all their money by running out and killing things. The, the hope is that there will be enough money floating around in the system that, that everybody will find that, well, we need that coin for these sinks, and the fastest way to make that coin is to take the things that we're getting, take the excess, because we have too much coal or too much iron um, relative to, to the things we use it with, and that they'll put that on the auction house for money. In the short term, yeah, we're not real surprised that everybody's um, just doing trading and stuff like that. It's a lot more predictable. It's a lot easier to do. Um, but we hope to see people using things like the auction houses more often, or at least you, you know trading in coin because it's an easier amount, an easier way to just set a value to things. Um, but again, because we haven't put in a lot of those coin sinks, it's not surprising that people don't necessarily value the coin yet. Um, but hopefully that'll pick up soon. So you're talking about kind of what you expected versus not. What have we done that surprised you as players? Well, that's a good question. Um, I, I'll admit that I was a little surprised um, by the level of coordination that I see out of some of the uh, larger companies and settlements in terms of, of exactly how how focused they are on you know scouting every single escalation and seeing where they're all at um making you know making choices this early on about exactly what to do um and, and i'll admit i was also a little surprised to, to some degree by the level of um players really wanting to be in you know focus on the company and the company you know everything they got handing it off to to the company instead of um, trying to create their own character as much, something like that. But I admit my my history is more in uh, in, in non MMOs. I think a lot of the MMO guys, when I'll say, "Ah, oh, kind of kind of surprising," they're kind of like, "Oh yeah, we know, totally knew that was going to happen." So some of the things that surprised me are a little different than the ones that surprise you know the folks here who've worked on a couple of MMOs already. Yeah. So how about surprises you have for us? What do you think is going to get us most uh, excited and surprised? Well, the main one I'm hoping to get get some, some traction on somewhere in here is to work a little bit on the combat AI and exactly what those guys do. Um, I, I, I was uh, pleasantly surprised, at least, when we changed up the way that they, uh, the aggro gets spread out so that people couldn't, couldn't just kite one person and do that kind of thing. So we, we'll, we'll be keeping an eye on players and, and trying to figure out ways we can, can get the AI to be more interesting. But um, I'm, we're really hoping that, that what we can do with the AI for it, not necessarily make it a really you know, incredibly complicated AI that, 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 that blows people away, but what we hope to do is at least get it to the point where people find that fighting against the AI feels at least reasonably similar to fighting against players um, so that you don't feel like you're learning weird lessons fighting um, the AI instead of, instead of players. Um, and, and I think, you know, when that kind of stuff comes in, I think players are going to find that they suddenly have to change their strategies dramatically uh, when fighting the encounters. Well, that sounds like fun. How about, uh, like, roving mobs of things? That's definitely something we, we hope to get in. Um, we'll probably do it in a fairly simple way eventually, um, or at least initially. Uh, we'll probably just do something where, like, the uneven encounter monsters you know, they get spawned into an uneven and then they'll pick another uneven encounter and walk their way there or something like that. Um, but long run, the, the plan is definitely to be having a lot more roving creatures. Um, and in, in particular, one of the plans was to have guards actually walking up and down the roads and stuff like that. In order to do that, we have to get the tech in that recognizes the roads inside the game and do, do a lot of those kinds of things. But that's, it, it will make things a lot more interesting trying to traverse the landscape um, trying to get in place to tackle an encounter when you're not right, quite sure how the other guys are going to move around and deal with you. So how about uh, 
tier two escalations. We've kind of a lot of discussion about uh, different levels and feels different. And some are really hard, some aren't. I mean, what do we? What do, what do you see? And by the way, also, when are we going to start seeing tier three escalations? Um, tier three is a little ways away. You know, we, we'll definitely make sure that we have some tier three escalation stuff in um, when you guys are getting to the point where where you actually need to start getting some tier three drops or at least in time so that you guys can stockpile some tier three stuff before you start really needing to craft that kind of material. Right now, because the AI isn't, isn't really up to the task of it, we don't want to put in a bunch of tier three folks that you can just farm. Um, in fact, I wound up taking out some of the, I wound up taking out the few uh, Ustalov knights and stuff that would drop tier three stuff just because we didn't want to have people finding that what they what they decided to do was just go kite the tier three guys so that you can start stockpiling that stuff because we'd really like to hold off on that until we actually have some some AI that makes it more of a challenge to, to tackle those guys and get that stuff. But now that we're seeing that, that more and more of the players have reached the point where you really need the tier two stuff, we'll be adding more of the tier two escalations. In fact, I, I just went in today and um, like, for example, right now, Undying Og only appears once on the map. And I'm going to leave that because Og, you know, he appears as his own boss. So I don't really want three Ogs running around on the map. But you will see, starting with uh, probably EE6, um, you should see, like, three of the Ustalov Knights landing and three of the Morden Spires. Um, so we'll start upping the numbers of those that appear um, and dropping the numbers of the lower level escalations. Um, so, so that there should be more of those. And we do have plans to add some additional uh, Tier 2 escalations as well. Um, but right now, I think the, the majority of the player base still needs to see a lot more of the Tier 1 and upper Tier 1 stuff. So um, I'm not too worried about the balance yet. Hopefully within a month or two, we'll have at least maybe one or two more escalations that have more Tier 2 stuff, though. So talk about the tier two. I mean, you got three different ones in here, and it feels like they're completely different. So yeah, they're they're different in a, in a lot of ways. Um, we try to vary up, you know, just in general, what kinds of, of attacks the monsters have access to. We don't have any complicated AI that says, you know, the goblins act like this and the Moloch cultists act like this or anything like that. But we can change up which attacks they have and which um, which combinations of monsters appear in each one. Um, and one of the other things that, that we've done that, that does vary up how the, the escalation feels is just what the spread of monsters is that you'll run into. Um, Undying Og, for example, it sticks pretty, pretty tightly with um, upper level ogres. Uh, so you don't get a lot of, of difference between the monsters there. They're all pretty high level. But if you fight the Ustalov Knights, they have everything from level one knight, you know, I think those are the pages, um, up to, I think it's level 14 or 16, something like that, uh, knights. So they have a really wide spread, which means that you can run into a totally different encounter because you can run into an encounter with just like a couple of 14s and then a couple of ones next to them. Um, and, and that lets you do a lot of different things going into that battle. You know, if they have a lot of low level guys, you can use the tactics of clearing out parts of the escalation uh, or, you know, clearing out parts of the encounter, taking out any of the pages from a distance before you actually trigger aggro. But if they're all high level, you've got no choice but to go in and take out everybody. Um, if there's a bigger mix of ranged guys, then, then it changes everything up. Um, and we try to do that between all of them, try to have, you know, more magic in one, more physical attacks in another, that kind of thing. So that so the players have to think a little bit about what they want to outfit their characters with going out to tackle that escalation. Um, you know, what what kind of characters to bring to that, that sort of encounter. Um, but yeah, I think I think you start to the main thing is that the T2 ones feel different in a way that the T1s don't, because against T2 monsters, all of that damage they're doing is so multiplied that when when they're you know when you're having one of their types of damage with the right armor you really notice that difference where with the t1 guys you kind of go up against them you're going to kill them all off anyway so it's not really a problem and you don't have to think as much about oh yeah i should get fire resistance if i'm going up against the moloch cultists or something like that 
With the goblins, you just don't worry about it. Well, but uh, the question I'm getting to is, it seems like the Tier 2 escalations, you know, it's much more profitable to go after certain ones than others. Um, that's possible. There's not supposed to be, I mean, the, the profitability, the, the drops you get are supposed to be pretty even um, across all monsters of a certain level. Um, so all the, the essentially eighth level monsters, whether they be an ogre or a knight, they should drop roughly equivalent stuff. Um, and in particular, the expendables, they should all be dropping pretty much the same expendables. Um, that said, it's certainly true that if you go up against um, a tier two escalation um, that has a mix of low level and high level monsters, um, and you're going to get much worse drops than if you go up against an escalation that's almost all high level monsters, because you just won't be killing all those low level guys along the way. So that's why people go out and hunt purples instead of reds and yellows. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, you will definitely get your best drops by hunting the toughest monsters. The, 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 the loot drops go up quite nicely. So if you were a player trying to gather up some tier two stuff, what would you do? So... I mean, yeah, I would focus on those tier two escalations, Warden Spire and Ustilov Knights in particular. Um, I would focus on encounters that have at least some of the highest level monsters. Um, that because basically, you know, if you want to get a decent chance of a tier two drop, there's really not much point in tackling a bunch of knights' pages or something like that. You can just skip right past those guys and, and go up against the, the tougher ones. Um, the other thing that I would really make sure of is make sure that you've trained up all your knowledge skills so that you're getting the best drops possible from those creatures. Um, and just generally speaking, as an overall strategy, I would make sure that I was tackling the toughest monsters that you're capable of tackling. So, you know, if, and ideally, I don't mean by that, you know, go out and kite the type, toughest monster you can, because kiting is also going to be a fairly slow and, um, inefficient method depending on on how well you you've got it coordinated for but but generally speaking anything that's time consuming is going to slow you down you're better off finding out which enemies you can really tackle and do it in an efficient way um so you want to get you know a decent party together and, and do that stuff and that's the other thing i would also say um, if i was really focused on getting loot i would go out with a six person party as often as possible because you get that definitely magnifies your loot drops as being in a large party Talk about that. Six people is the magic number. I mean, is it doesn't work for five or what? So it is essentially what it is is the more the merrier, but we only go to six. So um, I believe the formula essentially is that we're we're effectively dividing the loot up equally between all of the party members, but you get a five percent bonus for every additional party member. So if that, essentially. If you're on your own and you kill something, you get 100% of the loot. If you're, with, if you're in a party of two, you get 55% of the loot. Um, if you're in a party of three, you get, I guess, 43% of the loot or something like that. So being in a party of six, you're maximizing that bonus. That's fair. So everybody seems to have felt that when 4.0 came out, the uh, monsters got a little bit harder, or, well, a lot harder. Is that the case? Um, I think so with 4.0 that might have been the build where where we we made them spread their aggro out that definitely made made them harder no uh, it's, sen it's sense then it's not to spread the aggro it seems like they're hitting a lot harder in the past week or so yeah I'm not sure the I mean the only big one I remember it getting worse at was that brief period of time where with 4.1 where everything was you know filled with monsters um, I'm, I'm not aware of anything we've done that, that makes them hit that much harder, but there, there very well could have been some fixes in the combat math. I know Steven's always making adjustments to balance things out, um, and it's possible that he found a few holes where the monsters weren't doing as much damage as they were supposed to and fixed them. I'm just not aware of anything in particular. So let's talk about 4-1 and the monster get in. What happened there? Yeah, that was a really interesting bug. Um, 
we had actually tested and um, run around in on Zog to, and, and you would think that we would have spotted that. But what it turns out is we essentially had a, a, an encounter leak. So what was happening was whenever somebody ran through the hex and would run by an encounter without killing it off, that encounter would despawn. But the system that was keeping track of how many encounters were in that hex would say, okay, well, now that I despawned that one, I need to set up another encounter. But then it wouldn't actually despawn the other encounter completely. So every time you ran past one, it increased the number of encounters it was trying to put down in that level. Well, when we're testing it, and it's just a few of us running around, we probably made one of those hexes go from you know 30 encounters to 50 encounters. But that's not enough to really know that it's gotten full. You're just like, oh, well, maybe I'm in a full area or something like that. But when you've got hundreds of people running through the hexes, you go from 30 encounters to an encounter everywhere it can possibly place one. And that's when you start to notice that it's actually bad. But that's the reason why it snuck in and didn't didn't get fixed um, before we posted it. Fortunately, we were able to backtrack everybody and figure out figure out the, the issue relatively quickly and get a new fix out to you guys. But it's those kinds of things where you only see the bug when you're actually playing the game at scale that scare us the most. So how about uh, there's those people that love that monster get in. I mean, the, the monsters everywhere. Yeah, I actually I liked the overall effect of it. It was it was really terrible for me as a soloer because there were very few ways. I mean, I really couldn't get anywhere uh, until I realized that the riverbeds were actually relatively clear. So I started running in those. Um, and if we had our code working about the roads, then then we could have done something like that where the world is just that full, but it's not that full on the roads or something like that. And that would feel pretty good. The, the main thing that was bad about what was going on when the bug was there was that it wasn't just filling up the world, but because it was trying so hard to fill the world, you couldn't clear a path or do anything like that. So even with lots of players, you were going to just be constantly surrounded. Um, but having seen how interesting the world looks that way, I'd actually like for us to look at doing something somewhere in here where you know, right now we actually say, hey, try to have four 30 meter encounters, which are our large encounters down in this hex at a time. What I'd like to have it do is say, well, that's more of a soft target. Once you've placed that, every once in a while, place another one. And so if players are coming in and clearing stuff out, that'll tend to stay at the sweet spot. But if if players aren't coming in and clearing it out, it would fill up and then, you know, a large party could come through and sweep a path that people could follow behind or something like that. Um, so it's one of those things where I think actually, you know, we saw the bug and the bug was terrible at the time, but it has sparked some ideas here about how we could give some of that feel again. Well, it sounds like the crowd was kind of interested in saying, hey, when an escalation's at 100% in a hex, make it look like that. Or put more monsters when there's the escalations higher. So that is a potential way for us to do it would be to say that when the escalation is at full strength, it would start to do that kind of thing. The That would potentially work because, of course, as the player is, or as players are um, killing monsters, that's lowering the strength. And so, you know, if, if the if the density was only that high when it, you know, at the top end, then you might still be able, you might be able to clear a path under those circumstances. That is one of the things that right, right now, a lot of the settings inside an escalation are escalation wide. So for example, the monster density right now is a, is a number that I set for the entire escalation. What I'd like to do is get that number to be set per phase, which would mean that at the higher phases, I could set the density a lot higher. Now, currently, the max density is still only twice the minimum density, approximately. Um, and to get the density you were seeing um, when that bug came out, it's more like 10 times. So we would need a lot more flexibility there, too. Um, and there's also, like, like I said, there's some other problems where, where right now when it's trying that hard, it starts popping the, the encounters right in on top of players and stuff like that. So we need a certain amount of softer things there to get it to work. But yeah, it'd be nice for us to be able to attach that tighter to, to where the escalation is at as well. 
And right now, for those that don't know, it seems to be to me that when an escalation gets higher, there's more of the higher level monsters. Is that the case? The kind of more reds and purples and yellows? That is the case for the escalations that have multiple phases. So right now, the Ustalov and the Ustalovs don't have multiple phases, for example. So you see the same you see the same monsters and encounters regardless. Um, but and a little feedback. Um, so you see the same monsters monsters regardless when when you're running around in that. Um, but some of the other ones, like the um, let's see the the Rasmiran cultist, for example, they have lots of um, of phases. So with them, you will only see their toughest monsters pretty much when they're at their top end um, of that, which you know leads to sort of dichotomy there, where we kind of want you to clear out the encounter or clear out the escalation, but you might be thinking, hey, I'd like to farm that and get it up to the top end so that I can fight those monsters. So we we've been talking about some other escalations in the future where actually they get tougher as you knock them down, where that makes sense. Um, so that we can have a situation in which, you know, the harder you fight against them, the tougher the monsters get. So you're getting rewarded in that sense for, for what's going on. Um, we, we have to kind of play around with that balance and see where it works out best. So what should we expect in the kind of future? What's coming? So most of the focus right now is on getting the settlement stuff up and running so that we can... Um, get you guys able to actually, you know, be putting down POI or, well, holdings, I guess is what we're calling them now, but getting you guys involved in the actual, um, you know, settlement side of things much more than you are now. For the PVE side, that that does mean that we, we can start looking at more ways to um, connect the PVE side to the settlement side. I mean, obviously, there's there's the the basic part of of having to gather things to support your settlement and stuff like that, and eventually we'll we'll have the bulk goods that you're you're gathering from your outposts and stuff like that. But at its simplest level, you know, you won't be able to put down an outpost in an area that's um, currently occupied by an escalation. So it's going to provide more incentive to clear those out so that you can place stuff, and we'll start getting it so that. Um, because the settlements and the holdings and outposts will all be able to be damaged, um, unlike the current settlements or the towers, for example, we'll be able to start putting stuff in where having an escalation in the hex next door actually hurts you. So you actually, again, have a reason to get rid of that escalation that's next door in a way that you, you don't have that right now. So let's be clear about that. That means the escalations actually might hurt the POIs or outposts? Exactly. So you would you would want to at least get them down to a point where they're not hurting it as badly that's fair so a couple more fun ones um so emotes seem to be uh, your little fun thing where are you coming up with all this stuff so fortunately for me um there's so much galarian lore that that i've been able to steal a ton of that stuff um the the vast majority of of the common sayings and aphorisms and so forth come straight out of Pathfinder uh, manuals and stuff. So they're the the standard aphorisms for each of the deities, um, the special paladin codes for each deity. Um, I also just kind of do a search through, and you know, in the uh, Thornkeep manual, there's some common river folk sayings and stuff like that. So whenever I spot one in any kind of a, a source book, I'll throw that stuff in. Um, I've also, I also did a fair number of those um, text fragments, and that part I was able to steal a fair number from, again, from the books, because there's often little chapter headings and stuff like that that will have some excerpts from, you know, well-known books inside Galarian. But we've also written several, um, you know, fresh ones, and, and those ones are, you know, a little more of our deranged minds, and just based on whatever kind of um, escalations we've got going on and trying to help tell the story behind the escalations there. So, like, I know there's like 77 of 80 or you know that. I mean, is there ever going to be a thing where if we get all the book pages, we get something special? So, yeah, we've definitely talked about that. We'd, we'd like to have some kind of thing where, where when you have all of the pages from a particular document that you can bind them together into a book and that 
maybe your settlement can, you know, maybe you can put those in your library and get special abilities or, or increase the knowledge of your, of your um, settlement, do stuff like that. All of that stuff is just sort of, you know, random daydreaming at this point, though. So let's go back to the emotes. Um, and I'm trying to remember if it's Rennick or um, Patrick. One of them was talking about, hey, can we get some made specifically for us? You know, we'll be willing to pay to have our own emote. Uh, money does always talk, I admit. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I mean, we've talked about a lot of things that, of, you know, of different ways that we can let all the players, you know, personalize their companies and personalize those kinds of things. Um, that's certainly one of the easier ones. I had not, nobody's tossed the idea around of, uh, you know, purchasing emotes, but I, I suspect if I mention that to Ryan that his, he'll, he'll smile quite broadly. Yeah, we weren't talking about spending a lot of money, but it'd be cool to have your own. Money's money. So Lisa has uh, Yoda, and Lee can shoot 11 arrows in 30 seconds, and Ryan is a deep-sea diver. What's the cool thing you do? Uh, all my cool things are from my younger days, like when I used to play bass guitar in various jazz and rock bands or something like that. Um, yeah, I'm a pretty boring guy these days. I mostly play a lot of video games. Um, and, and do that kind of stuff. I suppose the probably the closest thing I have to a minor superpower is um, a ridiculous amount of pop culture knowledge, which comes from the fact that my wife runs an annotated Mystery Science Theater 3000 website where she annotates all the episodes. She's up to like 100 of them. So helping her do that has let me has reminded me of far more of the 80s and my living through that than I probably should. Mystery Science Theater 3000. Wow. That's kind of an interesting spin. Yeah, it's just uh, we were always big fans of the show, and my wife is a professional editor, and she needed a hobby after our daughter was born and decided that it would be fun to, to sit down and start trying to, you know, help people figure out what all the cultural references are in all those episodes. Um, it's, she's been working on it for about 10 years now and now has like three people working with her on it. It's pretty crazy. Very cool. So what's it like working at Gomworks? I mean, what are, what are the characters like that you work with? Um, it's, like I said, it's pretty typical of, of working at most small games companies. Um, you've got a lot of people who are, you know, they're very into games or very driven, um, you know, really want to provide a, a quality product at the end of the day. Um, but at the same time, or you know, trying to figure out how to do that with a very small staff. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely one of those things where um, I know, you know, growing up, I was definitely the the geek and nerd. I was, you know, pretty pretty classic. I was president of a math club and was in the you know our our computer club at, at high school and you know going with all my friends to various competitions on weekends and and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, for me, it's, it's definitely a very comfortable atmosphere because, you know, I was kind of joking around about the other day that, that you know, we, here in Seattle, everybody was really excited about the Seahawks winning and stuff like that. And, and, you know, there's certainly people here who are big fans, but this is one of those offices where I can go and, you know, the Seahawks are up for the Super Bowl and people are still talking about what happened in various MMOs over the weekend or news in the games industry and stuff like that. So it, I, I certainly find it's a good fit for my personality. That's fair. So a couple uh, last questions. Any thought about adding kind of rare or very rare encounters with the equally rare rewards? So again, that goes back to the question of doing something in there where, we, where it's kind of balanced out. Um, and right now, the other side to the problem is that there's, there's very little special I can do combat wise where like you run into this guy and fighting him is incredibly special because they do these weird, crazy things. As we get time to add more AIs and stuff like that, then that's definitely something that I'd like to do. Um, we do have uh, essentially the equivalent of random encounters throughout the world. Um, we've set up, you know, all the hexes essentially try to, when there's not an escalation running in them, they try to generally launch um, uh, encounters that are related to their terrain type. So if you're in the swamps, you get a lot more goblins. If you're in the mountains, you get a lot more ogres. But Every one of them still has a small percentage chance of launching, you know, skeletons at random or, or something like that. And 
So eventually I could put in something where you have a really tiny chance that any particular hex will launch this one really rare monster. Um, or eventually we may even be able to do it where they launch a particular person. Right now, um, I, I, I tend to kind of go against that just because I can't stop that character from being in five hexes at once. And likewise, I can't even actually stop that person from being in the same hex five times. Um, but as we get some additional tech, then that's definitely something I'd like to do um, where you could run into somebody just at random or, you know, they, they could feel like they wander randomly in this area of the map and can appear in any one of these five hexes at a given point in time. Um, and then once we can make, you know, encountering them feel special and like combating them feels a little special, then we can start talking about getting a, a more special reward for defeating them. Great. How about also the another one there? How about the wolves seem to get stuck in areas, run weird? Any idea what's going on with there? It's primarily just because they have a very big um, collision radius. The ogres actually have somewhat the same problem. So when they see trees or something in their way that, that's blocking the area or when there's a lot of other creatures in the way, they have more trouble finding gaps to go through. So they'll try to path a long way around and then situation will change. So they'll try to repath. And so, yeah, sometimes they just get kind of stuck. Um, it's just another example of, of a part of the AI that we need to work on. Yeah, I've watched an ogre do circles around the entire mini map before we can find a home. Yeah, they, it's, it, we could kind of fix it by making all of them have a much smaller radius, but then the end result would be that all the wolves and ogres would be interpenetrating, and that would just look weird. And, and also, given how tough some of those guys are, um, you probably don't want that many of them that close to you. That's fair. So any last advice for us, Bob? Any last um, things you could throw out? Any surprises? Once I'm going to I'm trying to get you to share things that uh, maybe you haven't shared before? The, yeah, I, I can't think of any surprises that I can share, unfortunately. I, I would just, again, give the same advice that, that the game is starting to hit the point where, you know, people need to start hitting those T2 escalations more and they need to start fighting tougher monsters. And as a result, I, I think it's just that much more important that everybody starts really coordinating, um, you know, and, and, and going out in large parties. And, and I, I'm, I'm hoping that will also include, you know, some of the larger groups actually, you know, showing up in the smaller towns and, and inviting some of the new players to come along on some of those parties, um, more casual, you know, groups going out and stuff like that. So that, so that people can do things in a more efficient way. Admittedly, you don't want the, the newbies necessarily going up against the T2 stuff, but I guess you guys have proven that, that new players can go up against AUG as long as there's, they're in a large enough group. So, you know, I'd love to see, see players, you know, grabbing up the noobs and, and, and hauling them out there in a much more casual way um, and, you know, helping them figure out what equipment they need to go, go with. Because that's the other, other big thing that I would say is it's going to start to be really important to bring the right equipment up against each of those escalations. You know, make sure you got your fire resistance up when you're going against the Moloch cultists and that kind of thing. Well, I have to say that we regularly take the uh, new players of the university out to fight Og, and they seem to do pretty well, even in groups of three or four. It just takes good tactics and a little bit of training. Yeah, it, it's one of those things where in the game, it, no matter what we do to balance things, numbers are all, numbers and coordination are always going to be the real secret to, to winning. Great. So thank you very much, Bob. We appreciate your time coming out and do this. This is a keepside chat with God Works Bob, the monster guy. I will say for those of you interested in going after escalations, uh, Thought has asked us to help him out just south of uh, Dead Men's Glen, actually wiping out these uh, bone dancers. So if anyone's interested, there's actually a group out there doing that. Uh, our next class will actually be tomorrow night. We have uh, Spitfire. And you can check out our class list at classes.pathfinderuniversity.com. Thank you, Bob, and have a great night. Thanks for having me. And anyone's welcome to stay in the channel and uh, do the after chat. Last time after Ryan was here, there was quite the chat. You open to any questions, Bob, from the peanut gallery? Uh, I can answer a few real quick. I had one about 
Is there anything ever going to be done about the mobs that jump over trees and tents and things like that? Because when you're trying to attack them and you hit your, you launch your attack, your spell or your bow attack, and suddenly it goes, you, your stamina is used and everything else, but it says out of range, and then they come down from over the top of the tree. Yeah, that's that's pretty high on our list of things we want to fix. Um, unfortunately, it's it's a little more technically challenging than some of the things we we've been tackling right at the moment. Um, but yeah, that's that's definitely on the list of things that, that we want to take care of. We actually took out a fair number of walls and stuff that we had in the encounters originally because they caused so much problem. Um, but the tents are definitely bad, and and as you say, the trees are the worst because they'll they'll pop them up the highest amount. Um, you should see less and less of the encounters appearing right on the trees these days. Um, but that said, if, if you know if if you're running from them or if you're kiting a little bit, they'll they'll move over them and, and you'll definitely have problems. Thank you. How you doing, Bob? Good. This last we spoke. Yeah, which, which one is this? Cheadle. Oh, hey, Cheadle. Uh, I did have a quick question. I don't know if it was covered or not. We uh, we were over uh, working on the uh, the filming for the uh, PFO trailer. Um, did you guys uh, ever talk about the artifacts or whatever they're called for settlements that will be that'll be for the you know, for the bigger escalations. Yeah, that's definitely um, in the plans. Um, you know, part of the reason why we haven't gotten those in yet is just the fact that we don't have, you know, the whole settlement system in and factions and stuff like that. Um, the other part is that we still need to get in some tech that has a better understanding of who's participating um, in, some, you know, in helping to defeat the escalation. Right now, almost everything is calculated based on the one person who did the killing blow of anything. And, and obviously that's going to be a little problematic for, for something like a settlement level reward. Um, but since we're, you know, starting to get in all the code for, for letting you guys have influence and factions and do all that kind of stuff. Um, hopefully some of those uh, settlement level things will, will start to come in. Awesome. Um, I mean, are, are you guys going to increase the, um, the level of difficulty for um, for these things to drop, or are we just gonna? Are they gonna be like regular, like tier one and tier two escalations with tier one and tier two artifacts that drop? Yeah, I think we'll. This is definitely something that'll probably just go on top of what we're already doing. I mean, we already know that the the reward we're offering for killing off an escalation isn't really adequate, um, <clears throat> but at the same time, we don't want the we don't really want to just hand out more low-level stuff either. So we, we want to wait on getting that reward, but that means that we can just put it in on top of what's already in. Um, but we'll make it appropriate to whatever you defeated uh, to get it. Um, and of course, we'll be adding additional uh, escalations and stuff that are tougher so that you guys can get effectively a tier three trophy um, for defeating uh, escalations that are even tougher than the used to have invaders. Fair enough. Although I think some people would uh, beg to differ on, on the current reward. Six expendables are actually really good, in my opinion, for our reward for clearing out escalation. Especially yeah, it's, it's not is pretty low. Yeah, it's not bad, and and um, of course those were a pretty recent ad. Um, and, and again, we did that because we felt that we weren't giving quite enough stuff. But the other problem is that those only go, like I said, to the person who does the final blow. So, you know, we really want to be incentivizing the settlement as a whole to go out and take care of the escalation, where now we're kind of incentivizing people to go find an escalation that's almost done and then go kill the boss. And we'd like to move away from that. Have you ever, uh, have y'all considered doing like a, a chest that drops and then whoever's in the area could, it, it would open up PVP for whenever a escalation was killed, whoever's there can grab it? Uh, we've talked about some stuff along those lines. It's possible that, that the way some of these rewards will come out will be along, along that. Um, 
we'd like to do something a little bit like that anyway, just to say that, you know, hey, now that you've vanquished these enemies, they're leaving behind some spoils. So there's a brief period of time where it's a really good place to go and pick stuff up. And as you say, to, to PVP, the, the folks who've already gathered some. Yeah, because uh, marrying different play styles and different types is always sort of creates that cohesiveness that uh, gives us content. Yeah, at a simple level, we'd like to have some stuff like, you know, if there's an escalation running in the hex, that that impacts the amount of resources that are available inside the hex, making it so that, you know, clearing the escalation means that for that 12 to 36 hour window where there's no escalation there, that, that that's a good period of time for gatherers to come in, but also likewise a good time for, for PVPers to come in and maybe try to pick off some of those gatherers. Um, so there's a lot of little things along those lines that we'd like to add, but it, it would be nice to make something very specific to, hey, you've, you've killed off this escalation and here's the thing that's kind of happening for the next hour or so to reward everybody for that. Awesome. And have you guys discussed uh, originally in the, the design docket that you posted for, for one of the blogs, uh, you said something along the lines of whenever one of these trophies, artifacts, whatever you want to call them, drops, we'd have to pay X amount of influence. Is that still, is that still sort of on key or, it, or has that changed a bit? Yeah, I'm not sure about that side of it. Uh, we haven't really talked about it in a long time. So um, no, I would guess, awesome. yeah, I would guess that's one of those ones that, that we'll revisit as we see how settlements are working and, and, and um, you know, what, what feels appropriate. Oh, uh, oh yeah. Uh, um, for defeating out the escalation north of Talongard, it's sometimes better just to leave the escalation in because it's nothing but purples. Literally nothing but the worst type of purples. Yeah, that's that's always been a, a big concern of mine is that in the long run, I don't want it to feel like the what you're supposed to do against the monsters is essentially farm them like domesticated animals. They're supposed to be something that you want to get rid of. And, and once we have those, you know, those, those artifacts and trophy type things available, then at least you'll have that incentive to finish it off because that'll hopefully be a reward that's worth more than leaving them in place so that you can farm them. But we also plan on having some disincentives for having them on your border. Like they, you know, they should be hurting your outposts a little bit. Um, obviously, we have the part where you can't build an outpost or a holding until you've cleared that particular hex, but since you can't build inside the monster hexes, people might decide to kind of farm that monster hex. But but again, if, if we make it so that if nothing else, the monster hexes are always the best places to gather. But once we've got roving monsters and once we've got the, the escalation there, you know, potentially damaging the resource gathering as well, then um, you'll have a big incentive to clear it out so that your gatherers will have a nice window that they can go in and actually get stuff. Oh yeah, R roving mobs that that kicks up the uh, the chaos quite a bit. I I have this is Takasi with Stoner. I have a um, kind of a same same topic of um, home hexes. Uh, if you could just briefly talk about the intention and direction of the home hexes. Um, the there are quest givers in all of the towns that direct to the different home hexes to kill certain types of monsters. And in Stone Root, we're close to three of the 12 home hexes. We've got the Ustalavs, which are a lot of purples. Um, we've got the Molochs, which are mainly um, reds with some yellows. Um, and then there's the Skull Crushers, which are the direction for the quests are to go and find ogres there, but there are very few ogres there. It's mainly whites. Um, what so if you could just talk a little about what the home hex is um like what the direction will be in the future so in the long run the home hexes will actually run some kind of specialized escalation uh, it may be basically the same escalation but it won't you probably won't be able to clear it out you might be able to like temporarily suspend it or something like that um, but they'll basically run a specialized one that has its own plot line and they'll try to spread and, and do all that kind of stuff um, right now, all they do is I basically just replaced their list of encounters and enemies, um, traded out whatever the terrain would normally call for with the same ones that the escalation calls for. Um, 
But what that does mean is that it's very random. So because it doesn't run any events or anything like that, if it ran events, then I could say, you know, oh yeah, go there and kill this particular type of enemy because there's almost always an event running that has them. Um, and I think particularly with the ogres, there might be a problem with any, I think we tell you to kill ogre shamans and it's, it's possible that, that you could go there and just because of the way the random drops work out, you just might not find very many of them. Um, so I may have to go back and revisit and make them more likely, but even if I make them more likely, there's a pretty good chance that they just might not drop very often. Um, I can say that for the Molochs and the Ustalavs, it's very consistent. And even for the Bone Crushers or the Skull Crushers, um, it's rare to find ogres. I've been there quite a few times, and um, the, the chance of finding anything above a lout or a runt is very, very rare. And even those runts are, are hard to find. Come to Og. Yeah, Og will have a lot more of them. Well, Og is fine, but the, the quest givers uh, direct people to the, the home hex above Alderwag, so... Yeah, I probably need to revisit that and, and um, make sure that the exact monsters that are being asked for have a higher percentage likelihood of dropping. I think I was just depending on the fact that they were included in the list, and so they should drop occasionally. But it's possible there's not quite enough of them. The other thing is we did try to word all those to say basically, well, here's a place where at least you can always find some of them. Um, or I should, of course, that's an overstatement because I can't guarantee that you can always find anything. Um, it's always possible that you just get bad luck. But I can probably do some fiddling and make sure that, you know, nearly every 15 meter encounter always includes one of those higher level ogres or something like that. So I'll, I'll take another look at those tables and see what I can do. Awesome. Thanks. All right, Bob, I don't want to have to keep you if you don't want to, if uh, you're past your time. Uh, I should probably get back to my family. So, um, but it's been great talking with everybody. Thank you very much, Bob. We appreciate it. Good night. Have a good, good night, Bob.